Good morning and welcome to the fourth annual Norwegian Circular Economy Conference, hosted by Sintef in Innovation Norway, together with NTNU, Nord University, and uh, UN Global Compact. Welcome to all of you here, and welcome to all of you out there, at your office, at your home office, at the lab, in the park, wherever you are. Due to the corona restrictions, we could only be a limited number of people gathered physically. But streaming means there's no limitations to how many we will be able to invite in to listen, to learn, and also send in questions later. And today, we've reached a record-breaking 650 participants from 27 countries. My name is uh, Benedikte Brinkman Aya. Normally, I'm an advisor at Footprint Consulting. We uh, help create and promote circular and green winners. But today, I am excited to be your host, hopefully guiding you safely through this uh, full day packed with exciting presentations, starting with State of the Nation, followed by Global Voices of Experience, and finally, uh, followed by voices from industry and finally matchmaking for Horizon 2020 and the EEA and Norway grants. So if you have not already registered, please do. And a hint from the pros, the more information you put on your profile, the better meetings you will get. And what better place? to broadcast all of this. Then from here at Dijkman, the brand new library in Oslo. It's a spectacular piece of architecture right next to the famous opera house. So do come by when you're visiting Oslo next time. But also, it's a two year, 200 year old example of product as a service. Carl Dijkman, he was a wealthy businessman and a book collector. And before he died in 1780, he donated his entire book collection to the city of Oslo and all its citizens. And that was the start of Norway's first public library. And today, Dijkman is not only a place to share books, but to share knowledge, to share curiosity, and to openly exchange thoughts and ideas. And to start the conversation, I was excited to introduce the Norwegian Minister of Climate and Environment, Mr. Sveinung Rotevatn. But uh, it appears he's a little late, is that right? Yes? Should we try to wait for him, or should we? We have to. Do we have any uh, any uh, message <laughs> from his entourage? If he's on his way. No. Mm -hmm. I can give you a little fun fact about a circular economy actions at Dijkman, because they don't only share more than two million pieces of books, of uh, DVDs and CDs and digital things. <laughs> they al also have uh, special areas where they have sewing machines where you can help fix uh, your clothes. They also have a special studio where you can uh, create your own music. And they really want to uh, take part in the circular economy. So for all of you here, in the uh, break, in the lunch break, uh, please have a tour of the building. But now, it seems someone's on his way. So the Norwegian Minister of Climate and Environment, Mr. Sveinung Rotevatn, he said, he says he wants to make Norway a circular economy front runner. But he also admits that we've got a long way to go. 
we've invited him here to set the stage with his circular visions, ambitions, and actions. So if you have your coat off, I'm proud to introduce uh, Mr. Sveinung Rotevatn. Much. Uh, good to see you all. Good morning. And uh, thank you for the invitation to attend this uh, fourth Norwegian Circular Economy Conference. Uh, circular economy is certainly hot stuff these days. Uh, I have uh, about now lost count of how many times I've been to debates, seminars, meetings about circular economy. Uh, it seems like everyone wants to debate how we recycle waste, how we reuse waste, or to be more precise, how we do not reuse our waste. Uh, waste is, however, only one part of the circular economy. 80% of a product's environmental footprint is decided when it is designed. If products are packaged in clear plastic, rather than uh, black plastic, for example, sorting machines will be able to sort them correctly. If uh, AirPods weren't glued together, we could change the battery rather than buy new ones. These are small uh, but everyday examples of the changes we need to use resources more efficiently. Now, a circular economy is not really a recent invention. It's a rather an old tradition. My grandparents knew how to save resources and how to reuse them. Single-use items didn't really exist. Broken things were mended, and clothes were repaired. This was a virtue of necessity. So should we then return to the past? No, we need to create the circular economy of today. The reason we don't want to use the same products year after year is because we want new solutions, better solutions. We can learn from our grandparents' mentality, but we can use also today's digital tools and technology. Because the problem isn't really that we're buying a new phone. The problem is that in the process, we're throwing away the old one. That way, a circular economy it's not about limiting yourself to old technology. It's about creating new technology, new opportunities, better products, better services. At the same time, we can use fewer resources and reduce emissions. Green growth is possible. To its core, it is actually rather simple. Cut emissions and use resources in a sustainable way. Deloitte has identified um, how uh, we can uh, use fewer resources, how we can reduce emissions, and they have identified the barriers and potential for a circular economy here in Norway. I'm very much looking forward to reading the third report that we will see presented today. In the former reports, Deloitte pointed to industries with a high potential for circularity. And they are, uh, first, construction and real estate, second, retail, third, agriculture, forestry, aquaculture, and fisheries, and finally, the process industry. So what we need to ask ourselves is, how do we do it, just as the latest report does? In general, the government has three main tools for implement, implementing our policies. Taxation, regulation, and support schemes. And all three of them need to work together for increased circularity. We already have environmental taxes on bottles and cans, for example, and several other things. Um, a major problem is nevertheless that we do not value natural resources highly enough at their true value. To make it profitable, profitable to recycle plastic instead of creating new plastic from uh, petroleum, it has to cost more to emit CO2, quite simply. The cost of the environment must 
be more reflective in the cost of the products. When it comes to regulations, they are obviously quite important. Uh, we can use them to force producers to make durable and reusable products. Requirements for using recycled materials in new products is one way to strengthen the market in this respect. Um, an example of this is uh, new regulations that we implemented from July 1st this year, where we made it easier to use concrete from buildings in new infrastructure projects as filling mass. When it comes to support schemes, the Norwegian government has uh, several of them. Uh, last year, Innova paid out a record high 5.6 billion Norwegian kroner to more than 22,000 projects in energy and climate here in Norway. I should add that we also have important tools in voluntary agreements and extended producer responsibility. One good example of this is the food waste agreement from 2017. If you want to bake one loaf of bread, it requires grain from about two square meters of soil. In Norway, we're wasting, on average, 100,000 loaves of bread every day. In a year, that's 73 square kilometers of soil. We're working together with the food industry to cut food waste. In 2017, Norwegian authorities signed a voluntary agreement with the industry. And now, three years later, 104 companies have joined the agreement to cut food waste in half by 2030. All key stakeholders are involved from soil and sea to table via food manufacturers, restaurants, and supermarkets. And we can already see the results. Food waste was reduced by 12% between 2015 and 2018, and we're on target to reach our goal. Producers should pay for their pollution. That is why we have extended producer responsibility in this country for several products. The producer is responsible for the product also after it becomes waste. We're currently using this tool for cars and batteries, tires and e electronic waste, among other things. I have recently asked the Norwegian Environmental Agency to consider how this tool can be used more efficient and how it can cover more products in the future. We need more knowledge about circularity and we need to share the available knowledge. There are still many questions to be answered. How are products designed? Are they easy to reuse? Is it easy to utilize the waste as a secondary raw material? What can we use to buy products from industry for? How can we strengthen the markets for secondary goods and raw materials? Can we replace products with services, not to mention digital services? Norway has a long tradition of cooperation between the government, the research community, and non-governmental organizations. In building a more circular economy, we must create new platforms for cooperations across sectors and industries. In our work with the circular economy strategy, 10 ministries are cooperating in close connection with industry. Cross-ministerial cooperation can be, should we say, uh, challenging, uh, but it is the only way to go forward. In the same way, companies must cooperate with each other across industries. This means setting requirements for other links in the value chain, such as requirements for material use, functions, energy use, and handling of waste. And we must also cooperate across borders, because most of the products we use are produced in other countries. For Norway, as a small and open economy, it is very important to cooperate uh, with the EU in this area, and together we are taking the lead. A circular economy is a transition to creating value and jobs within our planetary boundaries. That is why the EU has launched the circular economy as a key to a clean and competitive Europe by 2050. To conclude, we 
need to create a bigger market for secondary materials. And to succeed, we need to cooperate. Our ambition is to be a leading country in developing green circular economy that makes more efficient use of resources. And the upcoming strategy is a first step. Circular economy is not only about taking care of the environment. It is also about uh, creating competitiveness for Norwegian businesses. So that is why I call upon you to seize the opportunities in the new circular economy. We don't always know what the future brings, but we do know that changes happen even faster than before. And we also know that environmental regulations will continue to sharpen in Norway and across borders. And the winners will be those who are moving ahead and not lagging behind. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I'll hand this over for disinfection. And just like uh, all our speakers today, you will uh, receive a digital gift card from Plan International. It will be sent via email and it will be provide clean drinking water for children in need. But back to Rotevatn's words. He mentioned the Norwegian circular strategy. And in pre pre preparation for that, the Ministry of Climate and Environment asked Deloitte to create a comprehensive knowledge base to better understand where to go and how to get there. The first section of the report assesses key potentials. And the next section looks at main barriers. And the third and final section covers key policy measures. And the full report will be released today, right here, right now. And to take us through the key findings before officially handing, over them, handing them over to the minister is Caroline Persson Hager from Deloitte, Norway. Hello? Yeah, it's working. Thank you for that introduction. So, yes, so I would like to give a short recap of the study we just delivered to the Ministry of Climate and Environment. As mentioned, we were supposed to look at the biggest potentials, the barriers, and the policy measures for a circular economy in Norway. And our job was to assemble and systemize all relevant insights that already exist not to perform new research. So over the past eight months, we've done just that. We sy systemized uh, knowledge from the industry's own roadmaps for green competitiveness. We looked at a wide range of Norwegian and international research papers, policy analysis, and strategies for a circular economy. We also hosted a large workshop and received written input from around 100 key stakeholders from um, many industries, NGOs, labor and industry associations, as well as research institutes. And by systemizing all of that knowledge, we identified four groups of industries uh, that should be of high priority in the government's coming strategy for circular economy. And these are construction and real estate, it's retail, it's agriculture, forestry, uh, fisheries, and uh, agriculture, oh, sorry, aquaculture, and it's uh, the process industry. Now we did find that nearly all industries have potential to reduce and change their material and energy use, as well as to reduce their waste and increase recycling. And many of these potentials are also to be found in the collaboration between the industries. So what was particularly interesting with uh, these four groups of industries was that the potential across the indicators we looked at were just a little bit larger. So with actions within construction and uh, real estate and in retail, it's possible to reduce material use and waste at national level significantly. 
And for primary industries and the process industries, they have major streams of waste and residual raw material that today are considered waste or just even lost. But these are streams of byproducts that could increasingly be utilized in a circular economy without having to go through recycling processes. And the selected industries are also important in the Norwegian economy, either because they make up a significant part of GDP and the workforce, so that it's important to make sure they have a successful transition process or because they are uh, creating value and products uh, that have a competitive advantage in the international markets due to our vast access to natural resources such as forests, fish, and clean energy. But all of this is not to say that the other industries are not important, because they are. And this picture is not saying anything about the different roles that the different industries have in the transition process. And although waste, sewage, and recycling are positioned low in this diagram, they most certainly have a central role in the transition. But more about roles and collaboration you could find in the full report. So with the high priority industry groups in mind, we continue to map some of the most interesting business opportunities these industries could seek in a circular economy. Uh, and these opportunities were selected based on their potential for both increased value creation and increased circularity. In total, we identified 19 such business opportunities and we continued to identify the barriers that were limiting these potentials. And with that analytical setup in mind, it's obvious that we haven't been able to look at all necessary changes, all barriers and all policy measures. But still, by using these 19 business cases, uh, business opportunities as cases, we were able to both go into depth and find specific barriers and also see the barriers that are prominent in the primary, secondary, and tertiary industries. But also, while doing this, a pattern of more cross-cutting barriers started to emerge. And by addressing these cross-cutting barriers, it's not only possible to release the potentials in the four selected industry groups, but also in many other industries in Norway. Because these barriers represent fundamental elements of the current linear economy that is keeping status quo. So that's why we, in our final report, focused on policy measures to build down these cross-cutting barriers. So I'll guide you through our six priority areas that we think would be important um, in the coming strategy. And our first recommendation is related to setting clear national goals, targets, and indicators. So the government has set a target to become a front runner in a circular economy. But what does that really mean? Right now, probably not so much uh, until it's made more specific. To become a front runner, it's not only important to set targets for waste and recycling, but also for material use. The volumes and the types of materials that flow into the economy each year. And the government must also make sure to give Norwegian businesses a clear sense of where we're going and the area where Norway would like to take a strong position in an international low emission circular economy. So these focus areas could be specific industries, it could be value chains, it could be uh, mission or issue areas where Norway needs to improve or we, where we want to develop the best solutions and the best technology. And the coming strategy must clearly point to such priority areas. This is important both to reduce the risks in the business sector so that they are willing to commit to the big investments we need. But it's also important to um, get the most out of the public spending that we direct for innovation toward the green circular transition. In addition to goals, a holistic set of indicators will uh, be important to make sure uh, we know we achieve the targets, but also that they're achieved as efficiently as possible and to detect possible rebound effects uh, to make sure that we're not just moving the environmental impacts to a different part of the economy or a different country, but that they're reduced all together. 
So one of the most important things that the government must do to help accelerate the transition is to build markets for circular raw material products and services. And right now, as mentioned, the circular options are often not profitable enough. And they're not able to compete with linear alternatives, often because the full price of the externalities are not allocated to the linear business models but also because the current regulatory frameworks, such as tax and accounting requirements, favors more linear business activities. And which exact combination of policy instruments that will, will be the most efficient to build markets will depend on the type of material, product, or service you're trying to build a market for. But there are some general principles we recommend to follow. And the first is a shift of tax from labor to natural resources. And the second is the classic principle of polluter pays. So examples on the fiscal side are increased environmental taxes on primary raw materials. Such environmental taxes combined with reduced VAT on circular services will help us transition to service economy. But regulatory requirements will also be important to build markets. It could be setting requirements for a certain percentage of secondary raw materials in selected product groups. And we also recommend that the government follows EU's ambitions and set uh, mandatory minimum requirements criteria for environmental performance in public procurements for um, selected uh, sectors and product groups. And finally, to help support more research, innovation, and maturing of circular business models, increased funding should be given to uh, research and innovation support schemes, such as the Pilot E program and the Norwegian Innovation Cluster program. Because these cluster programs are also key to increase collaboration among industries and with research institutions, but they're also key to enable uh, utilization of residual raw materials and secondary materials at local and regional level. Another key lever to build markets for circular products is the, and, and to make sure the polluters pay is the extended producer responsibility schemes. And as mentioned, we have some of these schemes today, but we need more product categories to be included in the schemes. And the schemes could also be better designed if there were requirements and differentiation of the fees that the producers and importers pay based on the degree of circularity and eco-design in the products that they put to market. And we must also make sure that the fees that they pay cover the full cost of handling of these products and uh, packaging after end of life. We therefore recommend to establish material registries for all EPR schemes so that it's uh, easier to have a full overview of the total amount of products that are put to market to avoid free riders and make sure that the costs are distributed fairly. Another aspect which is important not only to build markets for high quality secondary materials, but also to make sure the current waste management systems are more efficient and more cost effective is to harmonize and optimize Norway's waste, waste management system. Because today, this is a fragmented system. We have the municipalities that are responsible for the household waste, and then we have the business sector that are responsible for handling their own waste. Further, each municipality have their own individual plans and often their own facilities, which leads to a decentralized system with suboptimal use of facilities and often small volumes of waste to process. Some municipalities have collaboration and have invested in uh, more advanced waste facility treatments. But these uh, facilities are not necessarily utilized to its full capacity. So to help aid these issues, we suggest to establish a national plan for a more cost-efficient system for waste sorting, treatment, and recycling in, in, in Norway. And to increase the volumes and quality of waste that it's collected, there should be a similar requirements for a separate collection of recyclable waste for both municipalities and the business sector. Now, digitalization is key for the circular economy. 
For businesses to be able to utilize secondary materials and residual raw material, it, they need to have predictable flows of these materials that meet the quality requirements they have to a cost they can afford. So we suggest that the government establish a collaborative project with industries to kickstart the data-driven and circular economy in Norway. The project should get a better overview of the material and waste flows that are key to unleashing some of Norway's largest potentials in the circular economy, and to get a better understanding of what type of data the industries need to be able to utilize these materials. Our last recommendation is related to knowledge and competencies. So the circular economy is complex, and it's not only about increasing recycling in all industries. There, um, in addition, there are a lot of changes that are specific to each and every industry. We therefore recommend to build tailored knowledge for key decision makers so that they can understand what circular economy means to them, to their business, and their everyday lives, so that they can make good decisions with maximum impacts. So this includes raising knowledge for key industry groups, for important decision makers in local and regional public sector, including public purchasers. And it includes the children and young people in primary and secondary education. And for the consumers, we should not expect them to take in all of the complexity of the circular economy. For them, it's more important to meet simple information through as few and standardized labeling schemes as possible so that the conscious consumers can take informed choices at the time of purchase. But to influence the majority of consumers, uh, we recommend to focus on economic, regulatory, and structural policy measures rather than informational campaigns. And I want to end the presentation with the principle that we think, um, believe should be the basis for building knowledge and also the basis for the coming work on circular economy. To avoid confusion and to join forces, um, it's important that the circular economy is not presented as yet another environmental consideration we must work on in addition to what we're doing related to climate change but rather the circular economy could be understood as a holistic framework that solves key environmental problems, including the climate problem. So with that, I would like to wrap up my presentation. It has been a high level summary, so for all details, make sure you visit our website and have a look. And the government are still open from feedback from the community until the 15th of September. So if you have anything key to add, make sure you do that within that date. And then I would like to have a COVID safe handover of our report to the minister. Thank you. Download, download the, it directly. You can take the poster with you to the office and they can all download it. Paper free and circular. <laughs> okay, and for all of you here and out there, uh, you can find the link and where you can download the full report at uh, this uh, conference uh, web page. There you will also find the link uh, to the next report because there's another report that feeds into the national strategy process. Because what does becoming circular really mean to our Norwegian economy and to our emissions? We keep hearing that a circular economy can create jobs, but what kind of jobs and where? Circular economy lead at Sintef, Susie Jaren, is here to give us the most important numbers and conclusions from their latest report on the impacts of the Norwegian circular economy. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Susie Aron and I lead the circular economy research area at Sintef. 
We're here today because we're planning what our national circular economy strategy will look like. But there's not just one version of the circular economy. There are many versions. And what we need to work out is what is the best version for us. So today, I'm going to present a collection of different results all put together that can help us put a little bit of uh, the puzzle pieces together to help us understand what exactly we could achieve. In Sintef, this year, we will carry out about 170 million kroners worth of circular economy research with customers, large, small, public bodies, NGOs. And this research spans all sorts of different areas, from battery recycling to using unwanted fish heads to get valuable pharmaceuticals. For us and our customers, it's imperative to understand what these technologies will mean. What changes will they bring about for Norway? What impact will it have on the environment? What impact will it have on our value chains, on our business models? And not least, what impact will it have on our jobs and economy? If the rest of the world consumed like Norwegians, we would need 3.4 globes to live on. Whichever way you choose to measure it, we are pretty much worst in class. And Norway is a country that is rich in resources. And we export these resources. And then what we're consuming is products that, on the whole, we are not producing here in Norway. So it's really important that when we look at our version of a circular economy, that we look at it in a global context. We have carried out a study together with ANOVA, where we've been mapping the effects of a, of a Norwegian circular economy on the global greenhouse gas emissions. In this study, we took 12 circular economy strategies. So this is, for example, share and repair of electronic goods, reduced food waste that's already been mentioned, increased use of cement recycling. And we've measured what the effects would be on the greenhouse gas emissions globally. What we found is that with these 12 circular strategies, we could have a reduction of a total of 6 to 10 million tons of, of CO2 equivalent emissions. Now, to put that into context, in 2018, the total Norwegian emissions were just a bit over 50 million tons. So a reduction of 10 million tons, that's enormous. And that's just from the 12 strategies that we've looked at here. Imagine how much more the savings could be if we were to able to adopt a fully encompassing circular economic model. And as Carolina said, the transition to a Norwegian circular economy is intrinsically linked to our transition to a low emission society. Now, all circular systems uh, and regenerative systems require an, an energy input, and this is our edge. Norway is uniquely able to offer the holy grail of circular industries, industries that are entirely based on renewable energy. Couple this with the world's largest uptake of electrified and zero emission transport, and we open up the possibilities for a totally renewable industry. But we might be missing a critical element, or rather, a group of elements. To build the low emission technologies of tomorrow, so hydrogen, um, electric vehicles, uh, wind and solar power, we need access to critical raw materials. So these are the types of um, metals that go into our batteries or into the magnets that we need in our wind turbine blades. And together with ANOVA, we've measured um, how much of these materials we're going to need to build the infrastructure that we've got planned. We found out that in some cases, we need up to 150% of that that's already available and these are and being produced. So, and these materials are coming from supply chains that are a bit risky and tricky anyway. But we already have these materials literally in our pockets, in our personal electronics and other devices. We will not be able to go over to a low emission society unless we begin to take care of these precious metals. You can read more about this and the other results in the full report, which is on the conference website. But as important as 
uh, the impact of a circular economy on the uh, emissions is, of course, the businesses, the industries, the workers, they're concerned about jobs. They're concerned about the economy. Wait. What? Yeah. Now we know a circular economy will not mean fewer jobs. A study that we carried out with the International Labour Organization, in fact, says that globally we can expect an increase of about 2.5% jobs with the implementation of a circular economy. But what does this picture look like for Norway? Well, we've done some number crunching. And just to take a couple of the circular strategies that we looked at earlier, personal electronics. Adopting personal electronics is very important. This is one of those uh, uh, waste streams that is the fastest growing. Norwegians create a bonkers 27 kilograms of personal electronic waste per year. We found that by adopting circular strategies such as share and repair, um, we could reduce the emissions impact of personal electronics by half a million tons. We could also create up to 20,000 new jobs. So this is, say, 2,000 new jobs in sharing and leasing services, 4,000 jobs in repair services. And it's a similar picture for other uh, consumer goods. For example, oh, textiles. It's on. Um, by extending the lifetime of a t-shirt or a jumper, we could reduce the emissions considerably. And again, we could look at creating about 5,000 jobs in share and repair services. There's also the possibility of upscaling, um, recycling and reuse of textiles, which we aren't able to measure. There's just not enough data yet. But this study is ongoing and with more information coming from other sectors um, in the end of October. And we will release the report also on our website then. So although the studies are in the early stages, the results and trends are quite clear. We will see job creation in Norway as a result of our circular economic model. For example, circular reuse uh, that is based here in uh, Volbeck and Oslo, where they've created an enterprise out of recycling of white goods. But it's very important to consider, this sounds great for Norway, but how is this going to impact on a global level? What we have seen is that if we m measure the effects of implementing a circular economic model in Norway, we create jobs in Norway, especially in the service sector, but we actually shift jobs away from the production sectors, especially in uh, non-OECD countries. So we see a significant reduction of jobs in the low to medium skilled um, manufacturing job sector. So when we go over to a circular economic model, we see reduced emissions globally, more jobs for Norway, more value creation for Norway, but it is at a cost. And we must make sure that when we make our transition to a circular economy, when we are choosing which elements we want to uh, choose for our plan, that the version of a Norwegian circular economy that we make is the version that will also create a sustainable and just world. The end. Thank you, Susie. Thank you. You can hold on to your microphone, because now I'm going to ask uh, Caroline and Mr. Uh, Rotevatn to uh, come up here to join me for some uh, uh, reflec reflections on the presentations. We can try to spread out evenly. And you will get back your microphone. So, uh, Mr. Rotevatn, what is your first uh, reflections on the presentations and the reports? Uh, well, I think this is highly interesting. Uh, now I'm uh, quite used to seeing presentations that uh, provide, you know, slogans and uh, and uh, you know, messaging, etc. So I'm not really all that interested in that. So the positive surprise here is that I think this was very to the point. Uh, a lot of concrete policy suggestions. Whenever I hear suggestions of uh, taxes or regulations, etc., I know it's the real deal. 
So I thought that was very interesting. Obviously, we'll have to study it more in detail, but uh, I think this uh, uh, looks like a highly promising um, uh, foundation uh, for the policy work that we need to do uh, th uh, throughout the rest of the fall uh, from the government side. And can you give us a little insight to what is that process that you're going into this fall? <laughs> uh, well, uh, we have been um, doing a lot of uh, fact-finding. Uh, we have been ordering reports, etc. Uh, commissioned a lot of work. Now we're trying to knit this all together. Uh, and now the, the, the real um, policy workshop begins. So uh, what I will have to do is I'll have to sit down with my uh, colleagues, um, you know, the Minister of Business, the Minister of Agriculture, etc., uh, and we'll have, and the Minister of Finance, not least, and we'll have to look through, okay, what of these proposals uh, are things that we think uh, can be launched, that can have support in Parliament, uh, that can lead us to where we want to be, uh, at the forefront of the circular economy. Uh, so this is a, a good old-fashioned policy uh, uh, workshop, I guess, within the government, and then we are hoping to finalize our strategy by the end of the fall, uh, and then hopefully that will be uh, the, um, the, the script that we follow in our annual budgets and uh, legal processes in the years ahead so that we can actually implement these measures. Can you uh, give us some clues of how you will uh, um, integrate these uh, circular strategies into the other strategies, uh, your climate strategy, your climacur? Mm. Uh, well, that is a very good question because when we're... Uh, when we're doing, you know, cross-sectoral approaches, and we always try to, you know, encompass everything, uh, and we do that in a lot of different lanes, uh, it's always difficult, you know, what to include and what to exclude. But uh, the other major document that I am working on uh, this fall is indeed the climate plan, uh, which will be uh, uh, handed over to Parliament by the end of the fall as well. Uh, and uh, obviously, there are a lot of aspects with the circular economy that are highly relevant to our task of reducing national emissions as well. Mm. Uh, so we'll just have to see how this can be integrated, uh, and maybe we'll have to do a little picking and choosing. But, uh, but these are um, two separate processes, and they're both very important. Mm -hmm. Caroline, I, you talked about the complexity of the process, and I just want you to hear from you. Um, what's been the greatest challenges of boiling it down to the concrete report to Mr. Rutevatn? Does it work? Yeah. Yep. Um, well, I think the greatest challenge was when we first started off and looked at the, the big question we're supposed to answer, what, uh, which industries have the biggest potential for increased circularity? So what is even that? You know, within in, uh, the work you're doing on climate, you have been able to find um, CO2 equivalents. So it's actually possible to compare across different gases and different sources of emissions. But the circular economy is so much more. It's the inputs. It's how much you put into the economy, what, what type of material you put into the economy, and also energy flows. And it's uh, what that comes out and what you do with the waste and the, the rest of the raw material. So really, it wasn't... <laughs> It isn't one answer. And I think uh, we communicated that in our report, but uh, I think it should be said again that there's not, not one right answer. Some industries um, are a problem industry that have issues they need to solve. And then there are other industries that are there are other solution to that problem. So, so they both have a big potential, but just different roles. So on the solution side, what, um, what made you most optimistic? Yeah. Uh, most optimistic. So there was a case we came across um, that I thought was really cool. And that was a Norwegian steel company that has teamed up with a Norwegian fish feed uh, company. And they're actually utilizing the greenhouse gas emissions as well as other emissions from this factory as inputs to produce algae uh, that can be the raw material for fish food. So not only are you solving a major climate problem for this uh, process industry, but you're also solving uh, climate problems and the sustainable access to fish feed in fish farming. So it's like one of those most innovative uh, examples in, in, of industrial symbiosis that we really must support and help accelerate. So Susie, one thing is to calculate these jobs and emissions in theory, 
Another job is to make it happen in real life. So do you have any advice or wish, main wishes for Mr. Rotevatten's strategies? Um, yeah, I, I think it's very interesting. These jobs that be, can be created now, they can be created either centrally by posting things off to be uh, repaired or, or so on, or they could be um, established, spread out amongst Norway. And that's what's really interesting, seeing what possible ways that these jobs could create um, uh, value creation and new jobs out in districts and uh, spread out over the whole of Norway. So I think that involving the commune and the municipalities is a really interesting aspect there. Whatever happens, whatever the plan comes out to be, what I really hope is that at, when the day it comes out and it lands on everyone's computer screens, they say, yes, okay, I can do this. And I know what my role will be in this, whether you're in industry, in research, whether you're in public office, like, I see myself here and I know what I've got to do now. That, that would be my wish. Thank you. <laughs> and then I'm gonna ask a final question to you, uh, Mr. Rutnatten, because when you uh, travel around to all these conferences, you're used to uh, hearing people demand things from you. But uh, now, uh, when you are uh, working on your strategies, what do you want us to do while we're waiting? Now you're talking to 650 scientists and business leaders and uh, entrepreneurs and um, students uh, out there. What should we do while we wait for your strategy? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> watch Netflix, maybe. Uh, you know, just um, get started. I mean, uh, I think the case for the circular economy is obvious for a whole lot of industries. And there's a ton of this stuff that is already um, profitable as business cases, uh, regardless of regulation. So uh, I think my main with message would just be get started. And then we will make sure that we, uh, that we land a, um, a, a good strategy, a uh, visionary strategy, and something that can hopefully provide uh, both businesses and individuals with uh, what, you're, uh, what you're asking for, you know, is... To, to find find their role in life, so to say, at least their role in the circular economy life. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we will uh, set our um, ambitions high. We will grind down into the details. Have to find what flies and what doesn't uh, in parliament and uh, politically. Uh, but I think that from what I've been seeing here, there is a lot of things that is uh, very inspiring to be working on. There's a lot of good proposals. Uh, and we will just have to move as fastly as, as we can in our political world. But in the business world, just uh, get started. And if you look at uh, the main trends around us, not least in the EU, I think there's no doubt to what the direction here actually is. So uh, uh, that is certainly a cause for optimism. Thank you. Thank you all. And as you will learn throughout the day, a lot of businesses and scientists and different organizations have already started. So, as we heard, there is no one standard version of the circular economy. But perhaps standards can help drive the circular transition. We've already heard that collaboration and predictability is key. So how can standards support that? Jacob Mehus is the manager director of Standards Norway, and we are excited to hear. What new standards do we need? And how do you help create them? Good morning, everyone, and thank you. Uh, standards and standardization uh, why is that really important when we talk about circular economy? I think that I would say that, uh, and to put it simply, I was asked to be a little bit bold maybe sometimes, and I, I would say that uh, I think standards play a significant role in making our modern and even more complex world work. I think standards just make things work. That's why standardization is important. And you could say that we would like uh, the circular economy to work, so hence we would probably develop standards. And I could stop right there. Uh, but as, uh, 
as individuals, organizations, societies, we're surrounded by standards from the moment we get up in the morning uh, until we go to bed at night. Uh, standards work for us, they guide us, they help us 24 hours a day, really. And Standards Norway as an organization manages and handles some 40,000 standards in all areas of society. But they're all, uh, very often invisible and very often unrecognized. Standards help with products, they help with services, they help with processes, uh, with technical requirements and regulatory compliance. But standards remain invisible and I think probably mostly because it just works. Uh, and why do we focus on what works? We usually don't. We focus on what doesn't work. Which is why when we get up in the morning, you drive through the, uh, you drive your car through the toll road, you don't really think about the communication be between your car and the toll road infrastructure. It just works. And when you use your credit card, you really don't, you don't really don't doubt, you, know, you really don't uh, question uh, whether that transaction will actually be carried out and, and your, the money you expect to get in your account that we withdrawn from your account actually happens. But I can guarantee you there are thousands of standards right behind it that make sure that that happens. And people have worked on those standards for years, and they still are, to help develop those standards to support those processes so it simply works. And that's what standards does. Uh, I think uh, it's fair to say that uh, standards support sustainability. I, I think it's uh, just simply a very, very effective tool to help us achieve the sustainable, uh, the develop, sustainable development goals. I think in terms of in innovation, uh, standards are uh, an important reference for new development and innovation. Quite often you start with standards, where are we at? What's recognized as the common kind of platform we're on? And very often standards or standardization, and this could be the case for a circular economy as well, it's the, it's the end kind of goal because if you, if you manage to get the standard established, it's recognized uh, very often across the world. Effectiveness, standards help us save time, increase quality, and uh, not the least, uh, create trust. And then standards and standardization is a very democratic process. Anybody who feels like they, they have something to say can participate. You don't have to travel across the world to, to participate in meetings globally. You can participate nationally, and you can make your voice heard or your organization's voice heard nationally and then uh, consequently internationally. Uh, but these are claims and claims are quite often you, you say, well, yeah, I've heard it before. How, how really useful is it? It's much better to have some numbers. So we have some numbers. We carried out a large study in, in 2018 uh, where we looked at the effects of standards and standardization on the Nordic economies. And, and these are just a few of the, the results that we got back. We see here uh, that we asked some, uh, just a second. We asked some 10,000 uh, uh, Nordic organizations and companies and got 1,200 responses back. And what they said is that really standards and standardization is good for business and it's good for society. They, the answers we got back, it said that for them, for the, the, the organization that provided a response back, said that uh, almost 70% said that it really helps them to get market access outside of their own domain. By, by relying on a standard, they can much easier get access to other markets. And these markets are, are quite often complicated to, to penetrate. If you work locally here in Norway, how are you going to establish a business in France? It's not that easy, but standards help with that. 85%, not surprisingly, said that by referring to standards, it helps with trust and confidence for whoever buys services, uses services, products, etc. Uh, some 50% of the, P uh, the organization that uh, responded said that it helps with the environmental impact of their organization. And of course, regulatory compliance, very, very important. Standards help with that too.
But perhaps most important, the most important result is that almost 90% of the organizations that, that gave a response back said that they consider standardization as a very important part of their future business plans. So business for standardization is critical for the business. Circular economy, we have uh, established a new, uh, it says TC, it means technical committee, it has a number, not so important, but it's, it, it deals with circular economy. It has participation from over 70 countries. Uh, the, the leadership is in France, uh, and we heard here several speakers have talked about how important it is to collaborate. And I, uh, Mr. Rutwalton said, just get started. This has started. This is collaboration. They are working. They are working on a, on a set of new standards for circular economy, and I think it is important to participate in this work, quite simply. And when it's finished, use those standards. The work done in this technical committee at the moment deals with four wor so-called working groups, involves uh, uh, maybe up to 2,000 domain experts across the world. Uh, it deals with framework principle, terminology, uh, implementation and sectorial applications, measuring uh, circularity, and then specific issues such as case studies. There is a Norwegian so-called mirror committee that follows the work of this technical committee. It is possible to participate in this mirror committee and hence influence the work of this uh, global standardization work. So why are standards important? They simply establish best practice internationally. It, that is important. They develop, uh, uh, they're developed by domain experts. Uh, they provide knowledge sharing and innovation. Standards, uh, uh, you, you get trust, standards are trusted and, and it provides m much easier market access. And standards provi provides compliance with international and national regulations. And like the president of uh, ISO, who's from Kenya, Ed Norogia, said, that standards are a key tool uh, for achieving the uh, uh, 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, and quite simply, our ticket to a sustainable future. I, don't, I really don't see how it is possible to achieve the sustainable, the sustainable Development Goals without further developing standards to support that. And that's why standards are important also for circular economy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So now we've talked about strategies and policies and standards. But the transition towards the circular economy is going to take a lot of ingenuity and entrepreneurship and risk taking. Innovation Norway supports the businesses of tomorrow. And uh, their director of sustainability, Inger Solberg, is here, here to talk about how the business support system can help with that circular tr transition. Thank you, uh, Benedicta. I'm glad to be here. The item uh, discussed today is very, very important for the future. Um, Innovation Norway, we are uh, located all over the world. We have uh, 35 uh, offices in 35 countries, and we are in all counties in uh, Norway. So we are where the businesses are. Uh, we are totally 750 employees, and uh, the budget this year is 14 billion Norwegian kroner. Quite a lot of money. money. And we support, let's see, uh, our goals is to work with uh, creating more successful entrepreneurs, growth companies, 
and, of course, clusters. Innovation need clusters and cooperation. And we do cooperate with other agencies in, uh, in uh, Norway, as the Research Council, INOVA, SIVA, uh, DOGA, and a lot of others. Uh, you have heard about uh, Pilot E mentioned uh, here earlier this uh, seminar. Uh, we have been working close to give risk financing from the idea to the market together with ENOVA and the Research Council through Pilot E. So, funding is not, uh, funding project uh, is not new in circular economy. As the minister said, we have done circular thinking all years. And uh, in our portfolio, we see a circular economy in the fisheries, in agriculture, wood, in uh, electronic, in every sector. Uh, we, have, um, we are really applauding, even we have been working with the circular economy in many years, we are applauding that this is now highly on the agenda in the EU and in Norway. And we are really looking forward to the coming strategy. Uh, we have been funding a wide range of projects, from higher resource efficiency, product reuse, material recovery, and longer uh, life cycles. Uh, since 2015, we have funded about 600 projects connected to circular economy in every sector. So here I'll give you some examples from the new one. I won't talk about fishing sector because there is a lot of circular economy in the fisheries. Uh, Waste IQ, it's a company up to the left, follow the clock when I speak. Uh, Waste IQ is a company in Bergen that develops sensors and ICT systems for monitoring waste at pickup points. The next one, the lady with the dress, Fjong, a company here in Oslo that uh, gives uh, subscriptions on using garments, not owing it yourself. And the third one, it's a factory in uh, Telmark, uh, the magic factory using organic household and industrial waste mix it with manure and produce biogas, fertilizer, warm water and CO2 for greenhouses. Collaborating from waste companies to the farmer, all the value chain. And the egg. Norilia, daughter company to uh, Nortura, the biggest meat producer in, uh, in uh, Norway. They are making pharmaceutical products from egg waste the embryo between the uh, skull and the, and the egg. The next one, in Odda, we find Boliden. They are recovering silver and lead from zinc production and from the old dump waste. The last example is from our international activity. Understanding the challenge, understanding the market and the business opportunities, in ocean plastic debris. We are offering Norwegian companies presence at international marketplaces and a combination of study tools and business development programs in foreign market. We call it Green Growth Program. You maybe have heard about it. And like the seminar today. And we have a lot of challenges. We have been talking about them already. Knowledge is maybe the main challenge. Knowledge about products of circular and long service life, or how to design a product or a building uh, for efficient dismantling and reuse of elements and a lot of uh, other items. The other barrier is profitability. A circular economy project, a lot of them has low profitability either due to labor-intensive processes, as, for example, repair, or small volumes for recycling materials, 
For the waste company, in order to have a competitive fee for its user, it may also be the cheapest way to send the waste to an incinerator or to send it to export. That's the main challenge. The last one, business models. We have seen many new business models in sharing economy, which also direct affect the circular economy. I mentioned Fiong. Uh, when a company takes complete responsibility for its product from the birth to cradle, the business model has to change. We need to enhance circular economy. Three ways, three recommendations. Think about new ways of innovating and cooperation with system innovation. We have been talking a lot of regulations and incentives. In Norway, we have now a lot of electrical ferries. Why that? It's because we have the industry that give uh, innovative solutions, but it was forced by the regulations and the procurement. And so we need international scaling. And then I think to succeed in international scaling, we need standards. Thank you. Thank you. I must say I'm a Fiong dress subscriber myself and it's, uh, I can admit it's quite uh, addicted. I cannot quit now. So, in Norway, we're quite competitive. We love to win, and especially to beat the Swedes. So uh, when uh, Mr. Rotevatten says he wants us to become uh, uh, circular front runners, we become very proud. But when a report tells us that we're currently worst in class, of course, that creates headlines. And last week, the first ever Norwegian Circular Gap Report gave us a score, and not a very good one. But can you really measure circularity in one number only? And what can the assessment behind that number tell us? Alexander Kristiansen from Circular Norway has been the project manager of the first Norwegian Circular Gap Report. And he's here to tell us more about how it can help us close the gap to close the loop. Thank you very much for this introduction. Yeah, the title of this session is State of the Nation. So then the question is, can we use data to say something about the state of the nation? That's the question leading businesses and organizations in Norway ask themselves. How circular is the Norwegian economy? And what should we do in order to close the circularity gap. And we have already heard that the minister has pointed out that Norway is going to be a front runner within circular economy. So then it makes sense to look at what happened on a global level and what is actually happening on a European level. We have been working together with the Dutch organization Circle Economy they have been looking at into how circular the global economy is. And today, the global economy is about 9% circular. And they have also been looking into how circular different economies in the European Union is. So then, what about Norway? Every country has a different starting point, and every country has a unique economy. But how circular is actually Norway? Today, the Norwegian economy is 2.4% circular. Or on the flip side, we are more than 97% linear. That is the circularity gap. 
So when we presented a number like this last week, we also need to go behind those numbers and data to show how are we getting this kind of number. And circle economy started to measure circularity for businesses, cities, and nations, and the globe. And they all started with an inspiration from a very famous paper by Dr. Willie Haas, where he looked at the circularity of the globe. And together with Willie Haas, and leading organization in their scientific committee, they developed a methodology to measure the globe, global economy, and measure nations. So in the analysis of the Norwegian economy, we have been looking into using input-output tables and material counting. And we've been using data from statistical Norway, waste data from Afal Norge, and we have been using the database Exeobase. So, in essence, the methodology itself is about how are we linking the resources consumption to the societal needs. So, we have then been looking at what kind of resources is needed in order to fulfill the Norwegian societal needs. And the resources, we divide them into four different groups. We are looking into the minerals, metal ores, biomass, and fossil fuels. And how much of those are needed every year to fulfill societal needs like housing and infrastructure, nutrition, transport, etc. And when we know that number and how much that is cycling back to the economy again, we are able to say something about what is the circularity metric. And when we have that in place, we are also able to start up looking at different strategies and pathways to become more circular. So, this is the material footprint of the Norwegian economy. Or put it differently, this is an X-ray of the Norwegian economy. And here you see how much materials are we extracting domestically in order to fulfill the societal needs. We also see how much material is used to, for the societal needs that are imported and what is exported. And in the very beginning, I said that the Norwegian economy is 2.4% circular. But if you're looking into this diagram, you will also learn that there are a number of other numbers and indicators describing the Norwegian economy, like the material footprint for export imp import, material footprint of what we're using every day, waste data, etc. So, what are we going to do to bridge that gap? What are we going to do to become more circular? And we have been looking into key industries in Norway and created various scenarios in order to, for Norway to become more circular. And for those individual scenarios, we are able to lift the circularity metric a little bit and reduce the material footprint. But the big benefit is when we are starting to combine the intervention between the different industries, then we are able to increase the circularity metric to almost 46% and really slash the material footprint and the carbon footprint. So when we are working with those kind of scenarios, we really need to think about strategies in order to reduce the, uh, that affecting the material flow into the economy. But we need also to look at what kind of enablers do we have, like how are we developing and designing for the future? 
how are we used rethinking our business models and incorporate digital technology? And indeed, how are we collaborating across different value chains? And when we have been looking into those scenarios, trying to bridge the gap, we have also been looking into what kind of skills and what kind of competence do we need to bridge that gap? And indeed, we see that the change makers to make that happen is the business, the governments, and the union. So we have been looking then at what kind of new competence and businesses have the opportunity in a circular economy. And at the very end, we have the consumers. They are the real players to help us become more circular. And again, it's about the businesses and the government to be the change maker. They need to create the understanding, the awareness, and the commitment in order to create their action. And here, it's an enormous business opportunity. What a business opportunity we have in order to design products and services with the end user in mind. And with that, we really hope that this report creates a lot of interesting discussion amongst the government and amongst businesses. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Let's hope you can come back with a better number next year. So let me remind all of you that you can find links to where you can download all the reports on the conference web page. And there you'll also find uh, the final report of this session. Kim Gabrielli, he is the executive direct director of the UN Global Compact Norway. And this year, they have hosted a series of workshop, workshops with 30 Norwegian companies and organizations to assess and present concrete business opportunities within the circular economy. And that has resulted in a stakeholder report. And what better ways to wrap up the state of the nation uh, session than with input from businesses and direct stakeholders themselves. So please welcome Kim Gabrielli. So let's take up the rock music uh, uh, factor a bit here. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of excited people on the other side after all these uh, reports, and now you're getting another one. Um, okay, I think you can hear me well now. Is the sound okay up there? Yeah, good. So um, there is an old saying that I want to start out with. So the, the secret of getting things done is to act is uh, sort of the motto. Uh, and of course, in order to do that, we need to go come together. And UN Global Compact Norway was opened exactly one year ago, and that has been the motto since the start. But also for the um, uh, action platform uh, for circular and uh, carbon neutral business models that we've been working on the last, uh, last yeah, since March this year, that has been sort of the mantra. Um, and we wanted to do something differently. I mean, of course, it's a stakeholder report I'm going to present. So it's a different sort of uh, starting point than a research report or another. But we wanted to not necessarily po point to what is the state going to do uh, or what are other people going to do, but we want to look at ourselves. So what, what, can we actually, what can we actually do as the business community? Young Global Compact has 11,000 companies as members worldwide and over 200 members in the Norwegian context. Um, and this report that I'm presenting today is supposed, or we want it to be a living process. So this is actually not the ending date. This is the start of the be beginning, if you want. We want to, to make a report that will be continuously updated. So that is... Uh, um, 
of course, a start, we, we don't pretend to have all the answers. We have hope that we can have more answers, but not all of them going forward. So uh, in the action platform, we have had some main partners. Norwegian, um, uh, Asplan Viak has made this report. We have had uh, Circular Norway with us, uh, Circular Regions, uh, and of course, Sintef, together with us in the UN Global Compact. Uh, but we also had 20, or we do have 27 uh, total participants. And if you look at how many people actually do work in these companies, it's 80,000 people, uh, and the revenues are 150 billion NOC. So you can see there is a lot of potential here. We have had many, uh, I'm not going to name all of them, but you know, some example, Posten, uh, Nye Weier, um, uh, Kongsberg Group, Jotun, Gelato, uh, IKEA Norway, Orkla, Shipstead, uh, the Green Building Alliance, you know, you have heard of all of them before. So how should I now try to keep your interest for the rest of the four minutes I have? Um, we have three numbers for you. We have one insisting wish to the strategy. We have five tipping points and we have 30 plus business and policy solutions. Let me start with the, the insisting wish. I thought it was quite interesting when the minister said, we want you to work across the business sector. You need to work you know, cross-sectoral. And it's challenging for us to work cross-sectoral in the ministries. How come he didn't say that we should work across public-private? Uh, I'm gonna tell Sveining that we have to do something about this because this was the biggest finding of the stakeholders in the action platform. We need to have more places to meet between the public and the private sector. And it's an ongoing process. It's, I mean, it's great that Deloitte and others now had direct contact, but of course the, 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 the report is now in, in principle ended. So what's the way forward now? So we propose a platform, a council, we don't know exactly the form, on a public-private circular forum, if you want. That is our first insisting wish, and we, we want to, to make this quite clear, and we think it's a good straight input into the, into the strategy. Five tipping points. And we are doing something the research has done too. Because we are using tipping point differently. So we are not talking about you know, what is, uh, what's happening if we don't reach these tipping points. We're actually going to talk about how can we tip the, the development in the right direction. So we are proposing five directions for the strategy that we have called tipping points. Um, and they're based on, on the work we have done, and you can see how we come, come up with them in the report. But it's prioritizing circular culture system resources, design for, uh, for zero emissions, of course, recycling of materials and products, uh, this transaction to zero emission in supply chains, of course, and not least, um, the mapping of, circle, the, of the circular economy. To my last, um, to my last uh, point. So, so how do we actually ensure that we can actually go then into the acting part of the, the work? Because, of course, there's a lot of things going on already. We, we all know that. We propose that in the strategy, there is also included an action plan in the parliamentarian, um, in the parliamentarian paper on the strategy. And perhaps you're thinking, oh yeah, that, that's not possible, it's a parliamentarian. I can assure you the same discussion is going on on the parliamentarian white paper on the sustainable development goals. They are discussing in the ministry, is it possible to make a strategy and include an action plan at the end of that white paper? Why shouldn't it be the same for, for this white paper? And of course you need to find, find out what's the balance, but it's possible. Uh, we, have, now we are working on, on 30 plus solutions. They are not in the, in, the, the platform, in the report yet, because and they will be coming. But of course, as you can understand, we need to work on them. We are going into implementation acceleration phase, you know, dig out what are the, you know, what are the real solutions, what are the best, should we look at all of them. Uh, and we are connecting with accelerator programs and actors as well. But just some, some answers, some solutions, of course. We are looking at e-fuel. Uh, we are looking at identifying uh, matchmaking, uh, new methods of doing that. Of course, uh, indicators and reporting on how to actually know the, the mapping and the state of, of, of Norway in cooperation closely with Circular Norway and the GAP report, of course. Um, and how can we create cross-sectoral secondary materials marketplaces? 
They're just some snapshots, and we will be coming back to this. And just to, just to conclude, so, um, yeah, we need more public-private cooperation. We need to make a dialogue going on the whole time in some sort of a forum or meeting places. Number two, we want... Um, we, we propose five tipping points as a direction, overall direction of the strategy. And number three, we are looking for an action plan to actually see things happening already from the start of the strategy. So uh, there are a lot of business opportunities in uh, SDG goal number 12 on sustainable consumption and production. As a business community, we would really like to see those business opportunities you know, be seized together with all of you here and all of you in the room. So with those words, I just want to wish the Ministry good luck with the strategy and we will send all the report to you, of course, uh, and we are very happy to con continue the discussion on the private-public um, cooperation. Thank you so much.